Thank you, Charlie. And welcome everybody to the second panel session for the, this day of the meeting. Um, we're gonna continue the theme of flexibility, but now we're gonna shift our focus to new things to consider in planning and operations. Um, so I'd argue that these aren't necessarily new things, um, but it's new ways of looking at things. So the researchers on the panel today are really trying to tackle some of the complex issues and the intersections of disciplines that have been historically treated separately in some of our planning and operations uh, processes. Uh, and they're really gonna talk about all the things that they're doing to try to bridge these disciplines that have maybe historically been treated separately and the new insights that we can derive when we start to think about these things in a coupled nature. So we'll hear about coordinated generation and transmission planning. We'll hear about the intersection of uh, renewable curtailment and the flexibility of thermal generators. And we'll also hear about probabilistic methods and grid operations. Uh, continuing the trend from yesterday, we have a lot of material and slides to get through in this session. Um, so I won't take any more time to uh, introduce the panel uh, introduce the panel and the content, but rather just jump right to our first speaker, who is Miguel Ortega Vasquez. Uh, Miguel is a principal technical leader with EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute. His research is focused on developing and applying methods for facilitating an efficient, secure, and sustainable operation and planning of so power systems. Me. Welcome, Miguel. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation for this uh, panel. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about coordinated expansion planning, which is probably not necessarily new, but I think it's important to emphasize the relevance of these uh, kind of tools when designing a, a, a power systems. And, 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 and there are many features that um, previous speakers have elaborated a little bit, like, for instance, modeling and storage and temporal chronology and all these kind of things in order to uh, meet not only capacity but at the same time also uh, invest in the resources that have sufficient agility to uh, meet the, um, the, the, the needs of the uh, ever-changing demand. So um, uh, that number 40C doesn't say anything to you, but it's, uh, it's uh, the number that in which uh, 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 is hosted at EPRI, and, and the name of the, of the project is Coordinated Expansion Planning, which entails generation and transmission, a little bit of distribution and emerging technologies. Um, so what's coordinated expansion planning? And in this presentation, I will not get into the weeds of the modeling, any equations or anything like that. I will just give an overview of that. Uh, uh, previous speakers in, 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 this, in this forum uh, have, have already spoken about this work. Uh, uh, some of them include uh, Professor Benjamin Hobbs from Johns Hopkins and uh, Professor Jean McCallie from Iowa State University. We are actually teaming up with them in order to develop this, this array of tools at EPRI and enhancing them and making changes to them. So what's coordinated expansion planning? It's essentially software tools. And what they are uh, after is uh, uh, addressing what are the needs of, uh, uh, of the power system over moon, many years. We are thinking, you know, five to 40 years. And, and, and they look at investment plans for both in generation and transmission. And as I said, for instance, in st storage and, and also the impact of other resources that might affect that. It's, it's a problem that, as you know, it's uh, full of uncertainty. And uncertainty can be categorized into two main groups. One, what we call global uncertainty, that, that that's the uncertainty that is projected over multiple years, that could be fuel prices, or, or, you know, siting of generation, or, or load growth, or, or many, many of these aspects that are, are, are affecting the, on the long run. And we also have what we call local uncertainty. Local uncertainty is when we take a temporal granularity, say a day, and we look at variability and uncertainty from production of renewables. So you really have to account that in a way, uh, obviously, you cannot embed uh, full-fledged production cost modeling in the in the in the ex, in the ex, expansion tool, but you should have a proxy that capture those needs in an adequate manner. Uh, it's a tool that is, is extremely flexible. They can model generation uh, and distribution if you are just looking at, at, at investments in, in supply or, or transmission and distribution if you're just looking just at the grid or, or the, the three together, generation, transmission, and distribution in, in, in all together. Also, you know, the, 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 the power system is it's undergoing a massive transformation, and one of those is the electrification of different sectors, including the road transport, for instance. So that would require 
uh, uh, changes in or, or will entail changes in the in the shape of the load and, and, and therefore we had, must account different operating philosophies as well like energy efficiency uh, uh, demand response uh, distribute the generation in 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 the in the, in the uh, distribution grids demand side management and these are tools that can support uh, you know essentially any any planner it could be you know, utilities rtos or even irp processes as well so uh, what's the difference between the, 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 the main way in which expansion is done, which is what we call reactive planning? Well, reactive planning starts by looking at the generation problem first. You start looking at what are the investments in generation that are uh, attractive and, 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 you know, probably some of them are, are, are from uh, generating companies that look at maximize their profits. Or if you are in a vertically integrated utility, you start looking at you know, meeting capacity and, and these kind of things. Uh, and then you say, okay, the next step is probably just let's look at the transmission to uh, uh, make uh, that generation, uh, 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 the energy from that generation to get to the load. What we are talking about in, in coordinated expansion planning is in closing the loop between the two so that you have an objective function that considers both, uh, both uh, objectives simultaneously and you uh, can grab the optimality that it's being left on the table by looking at the problems independently. Uh, so uh, CEP looks at generation expansion, responds by co-optimizing transmission and generation, uh, and, and, and would obviously result in better recommendations for expansion planning. So this is just an example of how would that look. We can consider uh, uh, two areas there. Uh, one of them, a remote area that it's uh, attractive in, in the, for capacity factor for renewables. That could be, for instance, wind, and let's suppose that has a capacity factor of 0.4, and there is a closer area that has a, a, a less attractive uh, capacity factor for wind, let us suppose that is 3.3, and there's the load. One investment plan could be invest a lot of generation and, and, and potentially less in transmission to, ma to make that generation available to the load. Uh, another alternative would be, okay, probably less intensive in investment in generation that is more remote, but you need uh, a heavier investment in transmission or, or something in between that you have you know, a little bit uh, close by in that uh, less uh, attractive capacity factor or, or uh, in, in a little bit uh, on that uh, remote region that has a more attractive capacity factor. So that can be mapped into uh, this uh, overall costs for the system. And, 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 and obviously it will not look as, as beautiful as this, as convex as this, but you know, that's the main gist that it uh, exhibits a global optimum. And, and, and what you are saying is the first one, it, you know, it's heavier in, in, in generation, uh, uh, but less in transmission. The other extreme, it's, you know, less in generation, but more in transmission. And that one in the middle is the one that potentially can minimize both objectives simultaneously. And that's the main uh, uh, focus on, on the coordinated expansion planning that's what you want to do these these kind of exercises there's this paper published by uh by uh, Evangelina Spirits from colleagues from, from you, from Andrew and, 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 and Professor Barry Hobbs, and, in, in which they actually uh, apply this method using their tool, Jasmine, uh, up to the Eastern Interconnection, looking at 13 regions over uh, 40 years. And, and then they, they uh, itemize the cost you know, for generation, operations, transmissions. And when they look at uh, reactive uh, 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 expansion planning, it turns out that the overall cost for the system is $1,766 billion. But when they look at coordinated expansion planning, the items in the objective function move. You can see that the investment in generation is less, but uh, in operation is also less, but in transmission is, is, is heavier. But overall, the total cost of, for the system is less, is $1,676 uh, uh, billion. So this is the, the main takeaway of these kind of exercises. So, What's, uh, many of you would say, okay, yeah, that's interesting, but you know, in my region, we don't do vertically integrated studies. Each entity have their own roles and they have assigned different things. They don't even talk to each other. So what's, what's the relevance of these kind of tools in these environments? Well, that, that's, that happens very often, but these tools are not meant to be uh, or are not necessarily be taken to uh, give you the expansion plans that you should follow, but you can use them as exploratory tools to see what the future would look like when you consider the uncertainties and when you consider the reactions from generation and transmission, the interactions that exist uh, between the two. So you can anticipate how the mix and location of generation will respond to reinforcement and that will have 
uh, you know, impacts on, 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 on lo locational marginal prices in, in, in prices for capacity markets uh, uh, that, that would have different siting uh, incentives for, for generation. And if you, um, if you do inadequate transmission expansion, you will potentially uh, favor load, load pockets that have uh, uh, you know, more generation that is not uh, 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 ideal for the system. And if you do uh, a proper transmission expansion, then you will make remote resources more attractive and invest in those resources in order to harness uh, renewables and make the system more sustainable. So uh, what's the relevance in, in structured markets? You know, for, from a mathematical perspective, when you sit down and write the objective function and the constraints, you can say that the coordinated expansion planning, it's just uh, 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 maximizes the economic benefits, which is the difference between uh, the consumer benefits and the, uh, the resources cost, which is uh, equivalent to a planner choosing investments when you are accounting for a perfectly competitive market, right? So now that's, uh, that's potentially, as you say, well, there are distortions in the market. Uh, you can model those, those uh, kind of distortions via some constraints or, or, or you know, policy requirements or any other externalities that affect the, the, the market and then end up with something similar. And this is something that was accepted by some regulators like, uh, like, the, uh, like the CPU in, in that uh, uh, transmission economic assessment method a report that was uh, uh, published in that um, footnote there. So uh, concerns with reactive uh, uh, transmission planning, that's a very risky approach for both generation and transmission. Uh, if transmission, as we know, it has an extremely long lead times. So uh, if you invest in a plan of transmission, that could be delayed or may not be large enough like you know, the example in Texas when they ended up with the, the CRES uh, uh, transmission that they needed to, 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 to modify, or, or, or in China in which you have uh, some uh, transmission lines that are not making the full potential of renewables available for the load pockets that, that they have there uh, because, because of, 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 or, of not the best planning on, 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 uh, on transmission. Uh, there might be the plans for transmission that are based on generation that in the end doesn't materialize. And, and, and transmission, transmission, essentially when you build a transmission line, that's a sunk cost. There's nothing you can do about it. You cannot put wheels on it and move it elsewhere. That's it. And, 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 and that's, that's uh, brutally expensive for the system. Uh, uh, you know, uh, eh, 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 uncertainties exacerbate this kind of issues and make it, make it even more important to uh, make this uh, uh, coordination between generation and transmission uh, more, uh, uh, the need to make it more, more, more in, uh, 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 to, to, the need to make it uh, studies uh, together simultaneously. Uh, again, uh, as I mentioned, you know, coordinated expansion planning has uh, some assumptions. One of them is that it, uh, assumes that there is an accurate representation of other entities' re reactions, which is not necessarily the case. For starters, uh, you know, uh, that's one of the things that economists uh, always assume, rationality, and, and, and you know, that's, that's one of the things that is less, less frequent. Uh, so so, so uh, uh, modeling the exact reaction of a, a particular play in the market, it's, it's often uh, 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 not necessarily accurate with precision. With pre with precision. So we, uh, uh, we can account this by modeling uncertainty, which is extremely important, and that's something that these tools can do and um, uh, it, it, the, the market response to grid expansion can only be est estimated as I was mentioning earlier you know more sophisticated model uh, may be able to model uh, market failures which is you know incomplete markets uh, escape of uh, scales of economy market power uh, transmission tariffs or, or any other distortion or externalities that you might uh, want to consider so so you can accommodate this kind of externalities in these models and get a, a, a sufficiently accurate answer to what you are after. Uh, the, it also, different objectives by different entities, that's something that I, that I mentioned, when you are looking at how it level policy with deep, deep penetration of renewables, may conflict with uh, zonal level planning that you may have in, in some areas. Uh, the opposite holds when, uh, uh, you know, higher level or local objective would be imperfect, are not perfectly aligned and you might end up with second, second best solutions 
uh, uh, and in these cases, you can even further modify the coordinated expansion planning to be modeled as a bi-level optimization in which you have one objective function as a master, and then you have a, 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 a second objective function as a sub, uh, uh, which is part of the constraints. And then you can do some mathematical decompositions uh, 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 using uh, et cetera, uh, to, to model to model the whole problem together and, and, and come up with a with a single uh, optimization problem as, uh, and solve it. Coordinated am I am okay in time? I think I'm okay. My family okay. So um, coordinated expansion planning. These are tools that are direly needed. When, when we are thinking of, of for the paths for the carbonization, that, that's something that uh, many, many, many members uh, or many presenters have already spoken about it. What, what that means, you know, the carbonization could be, could have different meanings for different entities of different places. What could be net zero in which you have sources and sinks for, for emissions. You could have something that is carbon free, which essentially you have something that is nothing uh, uh, making emissions or, or, or a system that is 100% renewables. Uh, and for that, you will end up uh, in all cases uh, seeing that renewables will play a major role in these future power systems. Uh, uh, we will have to model efficiency, electrification of other sectors and other energy vectors as, 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 was, as was explained in the previous session, like uh, hydrogen and, 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 and other, uh, other uh, uh, forms of, of, of uh, like bioenergy, et cetera. So, Having this coordinated expansion planning allow us to model this kind of constraints or this kind of, of uh, objectives in the decision-making process and find the ways to, that, or find a, 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 a manner in which we can pave the way to get to these uh, 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 paths for decarbonization. Now, also coordinated expansion planning doesn't only have value at a local level, we can only think, we can also think of these tools applied at a macro level. And with this I'm thinking of, for instance, at national level, right? When we are thinking that we are looking at or, uh, or striving towards clean energy futures, and we will need massive deployment of bull powers infrastructure. We will need to harness resources that are across uh, often uh, 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 distant electrical uh, 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 places, you know, geographical and electrical uh, places, and we want to pull resources at the same time. We want to make re renewables that are available at a particular time zone, available to another uh, time zone. And I think NREL did some of this uh, study, the SIMS study, if I'm not mistaken. So, so, so I'm, 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 there are these kind of studies, and I think ESIC is also pursuing this in the uh, macro grid uh, 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 study in which they are looking at, okay, let's look at how do we need to revamp the national grid in order to make uh, 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 the, the overall power system better. Well, in this, in this space, coordinated expansion plans also have value. They can uh, find ways to make the system more reliable and also more resilient so that you can, uh, 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 you know, minimize uh, 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 impacts to the grid. You can also attain sustainability for the whole system because you will be harnessing renewables like in the Great Plains and, and solar power that is available like in re this region, California as well, and, and, and you know, make it available in other places. And you will make electricity affordable. And this, this triangle, I, I, I used to say that this, these were conflicting objectives that you, usually you would have two of them, but not the other. You could have a system that is reliable and, and sustainable, but would be expensive. And, or I would say that you could have a system that is sustainable and affordable, but would not be reliable. Or you could have a system that is reliable and affordable, but would not be sustainable. When you, have, when you are thinking of this macro grid, you are uh, you know, touching on the three points together and, and ending up with a better design for the system as a whole that has this, all, all these conflicting objectives together simultaneously. Uh, Coordinated expansion planning has a, a many potential for research. I'm just pointing here just a few. One of them, uh, uh, previous uh, speakers were talking about chronology in expansion planning. That's something that we have already kind of worked at, at, at EPRI with the tools that we have. One of them include, you know, 
including several days in the expansion planning model so that it accounts for temporal chronology and that we can model intertemporal couplings like uh, the ones needed for, for storage and uh, also for flexibility and agile resources. You can also think for uncertainty. You can think for events that go beyond uh, uh, reliability, but in order to uh, assess resiliency, like uh, extreme conditions or uh, enhanced model for, for modeling transmissions, even uh, uh, this is probably uh, something that you will write to, 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 to Santa Claus, like by, by potentially even AC constraints or something like that, uh, 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 you know, having more, more uh, uh, technologies that you will account in your expansion planning, more operating periods, more candidate uh, uh, resources, etc. Et so, so, and, and this, is, this is something that probably will other, other, other presenters in this panel will talk about, you know, the need of modeling uh, or harnessing or do a better accounting for uh, local uncertainty, you know, using potentially uh, probabilistic forecast in order to uh, account for uh, system agility when you operate. And, and just as a summary, the tools that we use, uh, are, again, are in coordination with these uh, uh, PIs that I mentioned earlier, Professor Benjamin Hobbs. One of them is John Hopkins Stochastic Multistage Integrated Network Expansion, Jasmine, which is based on a stochastic optimization. Essentially, we model different scenarios. And then uh, uh, when, by, when modeling these scenarios, we are accounting for the recurs needed as the uncertainty is revealed over time. And then we, uh, the, the, despite or regardless of which uh, 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 materialization of the uh, uncertain parameter we have, we will remain as close as possible to the optimal uh, uh, as we can. Uh, the, other, the other alternative is the uh, um, adaptive coordinated expansion planning, which is a variant. It also models, it has to model some scenarios, but it's kind of a variant of a, a adjusted robust optimization in which you uh, uh, can tailor how risk averse you are by making heavy core investments here and now that will immunize your system to uncertainty down the road. Obviously, if you are completely risk averse, you will end up with very heavy core investments, uh, an exp a potentially expensive system. But if you are a little bit of more risk taker, you will reduce this and you will probably uh, have less core investments, but potentially that materialize into high adaptation cost as uncertainty uh, materializes down the road. So, those were my slides. Those are the, my, my, my takeaways that we really need to start looking at these problems in coordination. Again, uh, I understand that in different places, these, these are roles to assign to different entities, but having these tools is extremely important in order to have a north of, of, of where things might go in, in the future, especially considering this uh, uh, dramatic change that the system is undergoing in, in, in this path for decarbonization. So um, thank you, that's my presentation. And yeah, I'll answer questions later, thanks. Great, thank you, Miguel. Uh, yeah, please jot down your questions and we'll return to those at the Q&A at the end of the session. Um, our next speaker we will welcome virtually. Uh, the speaker is Will Hobbs. Uh, will is a principal research engineer in research and development at thank Southern you. Company, focusing on renewable yeah, energy and storage great. systems with a primary emphasis on solar. Uh, he has worked at Southern in these areas for over 10 years. He has a bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech, and he lives in Birmingham, Alabama with his wife and their two kids. Uh, so Will, uh, your slides are coming through great. Feel free to take it away. Okay, great. Can you hear me all right? Maybe? Yes, yes. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you uh, for that introduction, and um, I'm glad to be here. Virtually, I regret not being able to be there in person. Um, I know I'm missing out on uh, a lot of good stuff. Um, so yeah, we'll get into it. So what I'm gonna be presenting on focuses um, on our balancing area in the Southeast. Southern Company is made up of a lot of different um, gas and electric utilities, but we're yeah focused on the, the Southeast balancing area. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, primarily the EPRI OPSUN project, which is about using probabilistic information um, particularly forecasts in operations, but I'm also going to talk about the Solar Forecast Arbiter, which is a tool for evaluating forecasts. And then I'm going to talk about Flexible Solar, uh, which you could think of as another tool um, in the tool belt. So some quick acknowledgments. 
for the team that I worked with on Opsun. Um, thanks to these folks, many of them contributed to these slides. Hopefully I didn't forget anyone. Um, so Opsun stands for Operational Probabilistic Tools for Solar Uncertainty. It's DOE funded, an EPRI-led project. It's got three work streams, improving probabilistic forecasts, designing methods for managing uncertainty, and then demonstrating a scheduling management platform to support unit commitment decisions. So the project explored future solar scenarios ranging from seven to 20 gigawatts of solar across our footprint. Uh, UL produced historical reforecasts or hindcasts for a range of horizons um, using something like an analog ensemble, um, which I think is a, a fair <laughs> short description. Um, and then operational strategies were tested in a production cost model, uh, PSO by Polaris. So I should note um, that the inputs we used to model our system were just representative of what our system looked like actually a few years ago. So definitely not a match for a future system, um, but intended to still give insightful results. So a key attribute of PSO is the ability to model multiple commitment cycles, mimicking the real world decision process where you could start you know, up to two weeks ahead committing units and then um, making adjustments as updated forecasts come in through day ahead, day of, and near real time. So now a look at the strategies that were tested. Um, we looked at a range of different methods for determining reserve commitments. So the baseline was to use traditional deterministic forecasts. And then there were two probabilistic methods denoted P1 and P2 that were based entirely on historical observations, considering scenarios for either all possible conditions, P1, or just the most extreme conditions, P2. And then the next two probabilistic methods were based only on forecasted or forward-looking conditions, considering either the bounds of extreme scenarios or a range of possibilities based on a forecast prediction interval. Three of these methods required scenarios or synthetic scenarios to be generated. Um, and then all of these methods, including the baseline, uh, made use of EPRI's Dynador tool. And for the um, probabilistic methods, a robustness parameter is selectable. So for example, uh, a value of 0.99 would cover 99% of synthetic scenarios or a 99% forecast confidence interval. So now uh, let's jump into res some results that came out of all this modeling. Um, so I'll note that these are draft results from a few weeks ago. Um, things are wrapping up um, soon, so subject to change. Um, so here's the seven gigawatt solar case results and here's 20 gigawatts of solar. So before you get lost uh, trying to read all these tiny numbers, um, let's take a step back and uh, talk about what we're looking at here. So we have different reserve determination methods across the top of these tables. Um, and then down the side, we have a range of metrics that they were evaluated on. Um, so you may notice that some of these methods up top are different from the ones I described before. Um, I won't really get into these today other than to say that a hybrid of methods is likely better than one size fits all. We'll, we'll touch on that in just a little bit. And for the metrics, uh, we have cost-based metrics in dollars and then um, violations in megawatt hours. And these methods are then compared against the deterministic baseline and they can either be um, a little or a lot better in different shades of green or a little or a lot worse than the baseline in different shades of pink. So a note about balancing violations. Um, in the seven gigawatts of solar case, there were none, which is good. Um, but when we look at the 20 gigawatts of solar, um, many of the methods resulted in balancing violations, including the baseline, which isn't ideal. So um, this is a a good point to, to pause and remind you again that the way we set up this model was only representative um, and we didn't include things like capacity expansion um, that might be needed in the future. Uh, PSO can do that, but it was kind of out, outside the scope of this project. So now we're actually gonna look at results a little differently from those tables, hopefully make some trends a little bit more clear. So we're gonna plot the change in cost versus change in violations relative to the baseline. 
And you should note that the x-axis has negative values here. So we want to be down in the bottom left corner with a greater reduction in both violations and cost. So we'll fill in results here. We've got a range of methods and robustness levels. Um, and we can actually split the chart into two areas, um, areas below the line that result in a decrease in cost or above the line with an increase. So area one, we've got a decrease in cost and in violations. So kind of a win-win. So that makes it easy to re recommend these, these approaches during normal conditions. Um, but there's a limit to the amount of violations reductions. Um, and so if we want more significant ones, we've got to hop into this area here um, where we see more reductions in violations, but it comes at increased costs. So maybe these would only be recommended during extreme conditions. Um, so now looking at 20 gigawatts of solar and the results there, um, other than this one outlier, um, things seem to converge to a fairly linear relationship um, with a slope of about $900 per megawatt hour of reduced violations. And we can see that the most significant reductions, um, you know, on the, the left portion of this chart, um, actually all come from the P3 and P4 methods. Um, and so those help out the most. Um, and it turns out that they're about equal in terms of cost and performance along this line. So as a bit of a reminder, what is P3 and P4? I'll pull this slide back up from a few minutes ago. So you may recall that P3 and P4 are based entirely on forecasts. Um, and between those are really amongst all the probabilistic methods. P4 is unique um, in that it doesn't require the additional step of producing synthetic scenarios. So it's a little simpler to understand and to implement. So let's look a little more closely at that method. Um, so how it would work is you would input a probabilistic solar forecast, for example, for the following day. Uh, you would select a prediction interval or that robustness value, um, for example, 90%, which would represent the 5 to 95% probability of exceedance. Um, and then from that, you would determine your reserve requirements. Um, those are represented as the gap between the prediction interval bounds and the central P50 forecast, which is the, the black dashed line. Um, it's the amount that solar might underproduce and the, the bluish shaded area um, sets the upward reserves and the amount that solar might overproduce, um, the, the red shaded area uh, sets your downward reserves. So this takes us to the scheduling management platform or how we might implement this um, in, in practice. So the SMP integrates forecasts into the decision process. It bridges the gap between these data streams and decision tools. Um, so the SMP plugs in the middle here. It ingests the data. Um, you would produce scenarios for methods where scenarios are needed, um, determine reserves, and then visualize the results. So the SMP is a modular software tool. It's going to be released as open source software by EPRI. Um, and the way you interact with it is through a web browser where the user can select methods and robustness values um, and then interact with the display. Um, so that, that's really um, the conclusion of the Opsun project. Um, so changing gears just a bit, let's take a look at the Solar Forecast Arbiter. Um, so this project had a goal of uh, creating a, a paradigm shift in forecast evaluation. It was DOE funded and led by University of Arizona. Uh, it's open source, standardized, and provides for easy trials and can produce good reference forecasts. So I'd like to put some extra emphasis on the amount of standardization that it offers, um, standardization around terminology, uh, error definitions, like explicit calculations um, for error, uh, data formats, and just general concepts around solar forecasting. Uh, so I think this project is bringing a lot of value to the industry here. Um, if you don't pay attention to anything else with the Arbiter, taking a look at what's been done there um, could be valuable. Um, so uh, I've also got a note on reference forecasts here. Um, some of those, interestingly, could even run on a Raspberry Pi. I wouldn't recommend that for, quote, real applications, but it's something I've been playing around with for a few months. Um, and I'd be glad to chat offline if that sounds like a fun uh, learning experience for you. Um, so 
the arbiter can also provide for evaluation of probabilistic forecasts, which is especially non-trivial. Um, if you've ever tried to go through that exercise, you may know. Um, so at the conclusion of DOE funding, which is, is coming up over the next few months, it'll be transitioning to EPRI, um, where it's gonna be maintained under a working group. It's gonna re be rebranded as the forecast arbiter um, with additional emphasis on wind load and net load. Um, at Southern Company, we're planning to run a trial later this year. So um, stay tuned and feel free to contact me offline if you're interested in that. Um, and we also plan to join the working group. So um, if you're a forecast consumer or provider and that sounds interesting to you, um, please contact David Larson or Aiden Tui at EPRI. I think Aiden's in person at the workshop this week. Um, they plan to start a little later this year. We're gonna have annual meetings, regular updates, um, and support for users in uh, reference forecasts and, and general use of the Arbiter. So last, a few quick points on flexible solar. So we recently completed a study with EPRI um, with open access results published in Journal of Photovoltaics. Um, so we started with the PSO model from OpSun. Um, to simplify things, we dropped down to deterministic forecasts. Uh, but we stepped up to five minute intervals run for a full year, which I think is unique for this type of study. Um, we looked at the same range of solar capacities as OpSun. And then the important part, we looked at a range of solar control scenarios ranging from must take, uh, no control um, through curtailable, kind of a very limited control, um, all the way to fully flexible where solar could be used in economic dispatch and for up and down reserves. Um, and so comparing results, between fully flexible and curtailable, which you could think of as kind of the uh, incumbent, we found uh, similar reductions in violations between the two, which is somewhat expected, um, but with notably reduced total production cost for the case of fully flexible. Um, and then solar curtailments were cut roughly in half, going from about 10% of all solar energy being curtailed to just 6% for uh, the 20 gigawatt case. So possible future work here, um, you know, first is maybe a sensitivity study around storage. We did run um, some, some kind of static storage cases um, and we found that the semi-arbitrary amount of storage closed the gap between curtailable and flexible control. So running intermediate amounts of storage might tell us how much energy storage is flexible solar equivalent to or how much storage capacity could we avoid by, um, by implementing flexible solar? And then of course, what might probabilistic forecast do? Um, and so I think this brings us to a good point to wrap up my talk, pointing, pointing out this balance between forecasts, storage and renewable flexibility. So I like to think of there being different levers that we have access to for utility operations. Um, one of those would be probabilistic information like probabilistic forecasts. Then there's overall forecast accuracy. Um, there's the flexibility of renewable um, generation assets like solar, and then there's storage or more generally fleet flexibility. Um, there, there could be others like flexible load. Um, but the key thing is that improvements in any one um, could mean less need for others all being equal and then improvements in more than one or all could reduce cost and increase reliability. So my final point is I think that understanding how to actuate these levers and knowing what their impacts will be is key to the future of a low cost, reliable, low carbon grid. And with that, I thank you for your time and I'd be glad to take questions at the end of the session or to take them offline via email. Great, thank you, Will. Yeah, we'll return again to the questions at the end of the session. Um, so our next speaker will be Bethany Fru, but before we switch to her, we're gonna have a brief announcement from the DOE Office of Solar Energy Technologies Office. So Tasso Skolnas and Rodney Kizito are joining us remotely uh, to make a brief announcement about a recent DOE Solar Prize and future events related to that. So Tasso, are you connected? Hi, Caitlin, I am connected. Can you hear me? Yes. Without questions. Great. Yep. So let me share uh, my screen if that's possible.
Yeah, Tassos, could you maybe turn off your video? You're, it's a little choppy on the audio. I can do that. Uh, can you repeat that? Yes, I was able to do that. Can you guys now hear me better? Yes, much better. Go ahead. Great. All right. Well, uh, my name is Tassos Golnes. I'm a technology manager with uh, DOE and specifically the Solar Energy Technologies Office. I was, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, the American Made Solar Forecasting Prize. I had a few things to say about the um, um, the purpose of that prize, but I think I couldn't find a, a better way for you know describing the rationale than. Uh, Will Cobb's presentation, but I uh, just want to reiterate that we firmly believe that um, uh, probabilistic forecasting can help a lot with more reliable and more uh, cost efficient operation of the grid, especially uh, in, in the context of increasing uh, solar penetration. So how can how can DOE help with that? Obviously, the some of the projects that among which um, was the project that Will presented uh, we have some other methods as well, right? So one of the uh, these method, methods is the, the prizes. And in October uh, 2021, we launched the Solar Forecasting Prize, which incentivizes the innovators uh, to develop probabilistic forecasting tools. Uh, and we tested those uh, algorithms for 28 days in 10 locations. Uh, we used the soil forecast arbiter, uh, again, gracefully uh, mentioned by uh, Will previously, to measure and compare performance among those uh, competitors. Uh, we had about uh, 23 competitors uh, signing up and we received um, daily forecasts for about, from about 18 of them. Um, we also requested that the competitors submit commercialization plans at, uh, at the end of this evaluation, uh, again, to, to make sure that the, the best of the breed of these algorithms can find their way to the market. The prize in total um, has, if you will, a purse of up to $375,000. And we have about um, five winners uh, and an expected uh, up to five, again, anticipated uh, runners up. Now, this Friday on March 25, we'll be concluding the inaugural year of the Solar Forecasting Prize with the announcement of the winners and the runners up. Right? So, the runners up are uh, receiving about, what about, uh, $50,000 in cash. And sorry, the winners uh, receive $5,000 in cash, and the runners up um, will receive uh, $25,000 in cash. So to find out who wins, you can join us at the Carnegie Mellon University Energy Week virtual networking event. It takes place uh, this Friday on March 25th at 3.30 uh, p.m. Eastern time. Uh, you can use that uh, opportunity to interact and network with uh, uh, fellow practitioners in the energy space. We expect that the announcement will occur around uh, 4.30 in the afternoon Eastern time. You can uh, scan the QR code that hopefully you can see on the screen to register for the event. And we all hope that you join us then to find out uh, who wins the, the prizes I mentioned. With that, I'd like to thank Charlie and Caitlin for giving us the platform to inform you about the prize and the announcement. And Caitlin, if you have any question, I'll take it from you. Otherwise, uh, I can respond offline. Thank you, Tassos. That was great. Um, I think we're we're going to move on to our next speaker. But if anyone does have questions, please feel free to reach out to Tassos directly. We'll have his contact and information available. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our final speaker is Bethany Fru. Uh, Bethany is a senior engineer in the Grid Planning and Analysis Center at NREL, uh, where she is engaged in a variety of power system modeling activities. Um, her work includes capacity expansion modeling and production cost modeling. 
uh, including the work she'll present today on low cost solar deployment studies. Great, thanks Caitlin. Um, and I think we just passed the noon mark, so good afternoon. Um, as many of the other speakers have already said, really excited. To oh, I thought I moved it up high enough. Fail, okay, it's better. Is that good? Is that okay, Charlie? Speak, I'm speaking, hello, <laughs> is that better? Um, good afternoon. Um, hopefully you can all hear me, if not, somebody wave. Um, so I'm here to talk about curtailment. Um, so this is a small study that we published about a year ago. Um, one of the key focus uh, points was looking at the impact of how you operate the rest of the system, in this case, specifically looking at thermal generators and their operational flexibility settings. Um, we also wanted to see how that curtailed energy could potentially be used by solar resources um, to uh, provide a revenue stream or be of, of value. Um, and this was a pretty straightforward uh, project. We had a set of scenarios, we executed those scenarios, um, but we found some really interesting results that uh, were initially seemed a little contradictory. Um, and so that led us to kind of framing this as a, a paradox. So we're calling it the curtailment paradox. There's actually two pieces or two aspects of that, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so a little bit of higher level context. Uh, this is the Jewel article that was published. Um, the link is on the page. Um, I gave a, a NREL webinar a year ago, or actually, I guess it was last summer, um, but it's the, the longer version if you wanna hear more details, that link is also on, on, the, web, on the slide here. Um, awesome team of researchers that were part of this, their names are on the screen, and then funding from the Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies Office. So why are we focusing on curtailment and PV in this particular work? Um, economic curtailment, and when I say economic, I mean that that curtailment is part of the least cost solution, is really being considered part of new, uh, new normal in grid operations, where curtailment isn't this big bad thing, but it actually can be a tool to provide flexibility and help ensure reliability on the system. Some um, previous work that we've done looking at curtailment has found many hours of over 40% instantaneous curtailment in high PV uh, con contribution systems. Um, so this is not gonna go away, curtailment is here. Um, and I think we just need to maybe shift the way that we think about it. Um, and so PV in particular um, is projected to have the largest share of new renewable deployments um, given some of the projected cost declines and we've already seen some of that in recent years. Uh, this figure on the bottom left is from a recent standard scenarios report from NREL um, that shows in the kind of yellow colors uh, distributed in utility scale solar um, having significant growth um, out to the 2050 horizon. And then PV also is pretty sensitive to curtailment. Um, so the orange curve shown in the figure on the bottom right, uh, which shows the curtailment um, as a function of annual energy from renewable uh, resources. Um, you see that that orange curve is uh, sharply increases, which is really just reflecting that PV um, is very sensitive to curtailment. Um, so what is a paradox? I've kind of thrown that word out there. Um, I, I get asked this sometimes when I talk about this work. Um, so the definition I like the best is that it's a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. So something that might just seem a little contradictory or might not make sense at first, but once you start peeling back the layers, um, there's a good explanation for what's going on. And so the two pieces of this curtailment paradox, first, Thermal generator parameters, especially restricting minimum generation or minimum operating levels and ramp rates, impacts variable renewable energy or VRE curtailment more at a mid PV contribution level. In the system that we explored, that was roughly 25 to 40%, but just wanna emphasize that those numbers might not translate to every system. Um, and so it, that mid section really was where we saw the most sensitivity to these parameters, more so than at lower or higher PV contribution levels. The second, which it looks like the numbering didn't come through, right? So it should be a two there, um, while allowing VRE and storage uh, to provide operating reserves. So basically seeing if, if uh, that can uh, be a potential source of income or revenue or benefit for those resources, it does actually result in net benefits to the system. So reducing operating cost and curtailment. We actually didn't see that sort of positive feedback onto the resources um, at a device level. Um, and I think this really kind of gets to the point that was raised in some of the discussions we've already had, in the, especially in the previous session, um, where there's sort of this misalignment in um, incentives for resources. And so there's a whole bunch of market design implications that this points to. Um, so we looked at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, or LADWP footprint, um, using data from a recent uh, study at NREL called the LA100 study. Um, so LA is, you know, Southern California. Um, our modeling work 
uh, in the capacity expansion uh, piece, which was our first step in this, um, using the RPM or regional planning model, um, has a kind of nested structure where there's a focus area. In this case, it was the LA area, um, and the rest of the Western Interconnect um, was modeled at a, a coarser resolution to account for those boundary effects, uh, the, the LA area being at a nodal resolution in this um, capacity expansion model. Um, we used this capacity expansion model to develop six reasonable cases of PV and storage build out, um, not necessarily saying this is what's going to happen, but just kind of giving us a, a, a good starting point for exploring um, some sensi sensitivities. So those six build out cases are shown on the bottom, capacity on the left, generation on the right, and you'll see uh, six percentage labels on the bottom. Those are the annual PV contribution levels. Uh, I'll refer back to those same um, levels throughout the slide deck. So once we kind of established those base cases and the build outs, we then um, translated that data into a production cost model using Plexus in this case, um, and adjusted a bunch of levers for those different thermal resources and other settings to then explore a, a set of sensitivity cases. And in that, I should mention, in that case, we only ran um, the LA system as kind of an eyelided system. We didn't run the full Western Interconnect. So this table just giving you a, a quick snapshot at what some of the statistics related to those base, those six base um, cases for the build out levels. Um, you see the, the PV uh, labels on the far right in the blue. And then we see as we move to the right, um, total variable renewable um, energy contribution as a percent uh, energy basis. Uh, we then see the uh, contribution from storage on a capacity basis. And then we see some curtailment numbers first for VRE and then for PV. Um, those numbers are relative to the available resource within first the VRE only and then PV only, which is why you'll note that some of the PV numbers are actually larger. Uh, the denominator is different in those two columns. So we have a base case plus 13 sensitivity scenarios for each of those six build out levels resulting in 14 scenarios times six giving us 84 unique instances that we ran. Not gonna go through every word in this table, I know it's dense, um, but this is just meant to give you a, a view, a high level view hopefully of the different uh, scenarios that we ran. The base case is sort of the reddish color on the top. Um, the next level down are thermal plant flexibility factors. So what we did here was really take a very stylized bookend approach where we had uh, a more flexible version and a less flex flexible version. Those are our two bookend cases. And we looked at min gen or minimum generation levels, minimum up and down time and ramping limits. Um, so for each of those, uh, you'll see a, a more flexible and a less flexible option. Then we have kind of in the orange uh, section below that, uh, eligibility rules related to wind, solar, and storage providing operating reserves. So in our base case, we allow those resources to provide reserves, which is actually uh, contrary to how it's uh, handled in most, uh, not all, but most regions in the United States right now. Um, and so these were really a way to kind of understand, well, if we kind of back off those assumptions, um, is there sort of a, a negative um, impact on the system by not allowing those resources to provide reserves? And this lets us understand um, the potential benefit of those resources uh, using curtailed energy for, um, for reserves, in particular from PV, since this is a solar focused study. Um, and then other operational constraints uh, constitute that final section on the bottom, kind of this purple color, uh, sort of a grab bag of options, um, to five minute resolution instead of hourly. So looking at the impact of the temporal resolution, um, the DART is day ahead real time. So that's where we have forecasting errors um, and accounting for the impact of that in the pass down from the commitment decisions in the day ahead to the real time operations. We did not do probabilistic forecasts, so uh, nothing as rigorous as we've heard in some of the previous uh, presentations and, and elsewhere this, this week. Um, so just take the results from uh, what I show on the forecast part with the grain of salt. Um, no storage, which is basically a counterfactual uh, point of comparison that demonstrates the, the significant benefit that storage provides. And then copper plate, um, just kind of relaxing all the transmission constraints. So again, very stylized. These are sort of meant to be high level insights into what's driving curtailment so that we can understand um, how we might need to think differently about the system as we evolve to higher contribution levels from renewables. So I'm gonna talk about the two paradox elements and then I have a few closing thoughts that might prompt some discussion since we'll head into that next. Um, so first, thermal flexibility matters most in the middle. 
So this figure is showing curtailment on the vertical axis and it's total VRE, so that's wind and solar. Um, and then it's just the PV portion on the penetration level or contribution level on the horizontal axis. And the different lines, the different colors that you see here are just reflecting the different sensitivity cases, um, showing everything except for the operating reserve sensitivity cases. I'll show that in the next um, uh, set of results. And so the first point here to highlight is that no storage, uh, which is the sharply increasing line that you see, um, serves as a counterfactual case and really demonstrates the benefit of storage and mitigating curtailment. Um, in this particular system, we see 30% kind of being a critical point at which you really can't um, increase the amount of renewables without um, having significant curtailment impacts. Obviously that 30% may not translate to other systems. So again, just a, a rough starting point. And then we see what we're calling a transition zone or Goldilocks zone. And I wanted to make a joke about the three bears because we've had so many animal analogies thrown out here. So we'll just add bears to the mix with chickens and eggs and ducks and emus and camels. And I don't remember what else, uh, all the different curves. Um, but what I mean by that is that there's a, a wider uh, gap or band or spread between these different sensitivity cases and that roughly 25 to 40% PV contribution portion, um, which indicates that there's um, you know, sensitivity, greater sensitivity to those thermal uh, operating parameters. Um, and so what's driving this is that you have just the right amount, back to the Goldilocks, of renewable resources to actually see curtailment and you still have enough thermal resources on your system before you start retiring those resources in the, the higher PV contribution levels to, for those thermal parameters to matter. So you kind of have enough of both pieces to see an impact in both terms of curtailment and the, the, uh, the sensitivity based on the thermal generator parameters. So this suggests that there might be a need for a phased approach uh, in our ongoing grid transformation. So sort of uh, different paradigms, perhaps, um, from an operator perspective, as we're transitioning to greater contribution levels from renewables um, and understanding particularly the sensitivity to these generator settings in that middle section. And then we saw, again, in this case, with all of the assumptions that we use, a significantly smaller impact um, on curtailment from those other kind of grab bag of, of sensitivity cases, the greater resolution temporally, the forecast error, uh, the copper plate, um, for example. So again, more work probably needs to be done to really flesh that part out. But we didn't see significant impacts in the uh, assumptions that we used. Um, so just to dig in a little bit more here, this uh, set of figures are showing the change in generation from base. So this is a difference plot, positive meaning it's larger than the base case, negative uh, smaller than the base case. And these are the thermal generator um, sensitivities. So greater flexibility and less flexibility within each of the min gen, min up and downtime and ramp rate categories. And so what we see here um, first is that minimum generation levels and ramp rates yield the largest difference in dispatch. So uh, MinGen and ramp rates um, were the most, uh, or curtailment was most sensitive to those uh, parameters. Um, and so what we see in scenarios with greater thermal flexibility is that there's generally more solar, gas CC, and coal generation with less CT, uh, gas CT generation. In scenarios with less thermal generator flexibility, there's less coal and solar with a uh, nuanced trade-offs among gas, uh, natural gas fire generation. And the key driver um, kind of underlying all of this is a trade-off in cost and flexibility. So on one end, you have coal generators that are very inflexible, but relatively low cost. On the other end, you have gas CTs that are very flexible, but relatively higher cost gas CCs in the middle. And so as you shift the, or kind of relax or tighten the constraints on the flexibility, it sort of shifts which of those resources you need to use, um, which obviously has an impact on, on cost as well. Um, so for example, in the, the zero min gen, uh, which is the far right um, set of, of uh, bars in this figure, um, and if I just look at the 33% um, example that I, I put the red box around as an example, um, you know, when you have that zero min gen, you're effectively relaxing the minimum generation constraint entirely. And so those inflexible coal plants now become very flexible from an operational perspective, not saying this is what would actually happen with any generator, again, very bookend stylized approach, um, but it shows how it, you're able to use more of that coal generation, um, you're able to uh, have more solar, which is also a low cost resource. Um, and you, you use some of your gas CC, but you don't need very much CC um, at all. And so you see a reduction in, um, sorry, I meant to say the gas CT. You don't need gas CT at all, which is why you see a, a large negative value for that gas CT contribution. 
Um, so the second paradox uh, is that curtailed PV in a very colloquial term eats its own lunch um, with at least respect to operating reserves. Um, so this is kind of that self cannibalization effect that um, I think we've all kind of hinted at in some of the discussion. Um, and it's been in, in a lot of uh, market design conversations where uh, you start having these uh, very shallow operating reserve markets. And when storage in particular plays into those, you have this really cheap resource, um, you saturate those markets really quickly, it drives the prices down. And so suddenly the benefit um, that, that those resources might provide isn't reflected in the price outcomes from those markets. Um, and so trying to use that curtailed energy from PV to, uh, to be a, basically a revenue source for those resources um, really gets um, taken away, especially by the storage being in the system. And I'll dig into all this. So first figure, same layout as the last, uh, uh, the last kind of set that we looked at, but this is looking at the operating reserve uh, sensitivity cases. Um, and so we see that at high PV contribution levels, um, not allowing wind and solar or storage to provide reserves, um, which is our no VRE or storage reserve scenario, yield significant curtailment increases. And so in this um, kind of 44%, which is the highest PV uh, contribution level, um, we see 53% more curtailment relative to the base case. I forgot to mention that the, um, the text boxes with the percent in these figures on the upper part are the storage uh, contribution level. So those correspond to that summary uh, base case uh, table that I showed at the beginning. And this was the same as in the, the last curtailment figure, but in case that was confusing, um, those are just giving an idea of what the storage levels were. So if we focus on this uh, point that's circled here where we see a 53% reduction, or sorry, 53% increase in curtailment, um, what's driving that difference? And it's really just the thermal generators that are being committed or not committed. And so we see the base scenario on the left, which is where we allow wind, solar, and storage to provide reserves. And then the no VRE or storage reserves on the right, where we don't allow those resources to provide reserves. We see gas CC, CTs, and biopower. Coal is retired by this point in the system, which is why we don't show that here. Um, and so what you see is that there's large swaths of that left column where you don't have any committed or generating um, outcomes from those resources. And so this allows us to reduce the generation for this technology significantly, thereby allowing greater utilization of your renewables and storage, um, and also reducing curtailment, and then also reducing cost um, pretty significantly as well. So I don't think I'm gonna have much time to go through this slide, but um, I wanna touch on the, the reserve price trends because I think this kind of pulls it together with that kind of misalignment between the value that these resources provide. Right? I just said that there were cost benefits, there were curtailment benefits by allowing uh, wind, solar, and storage to provide reserves, but this doesn't necessarily translate to increased revenues. And so we look at price outcomes to make that point. I'm not gonna talk through every point on this figure, uh, but these are average reserve prices. In this case, using spinning reserve as an example, we modeled six different reserve products, uh, but this again, just an illustrative example. The base case on the bottom right, and then the other three panels are our three uh, reserve eligibility sensitivity scenarios. And so we see that um, reserve or scarcity uh, condition, sorry, reserve shortage or scarcity conditions um, do occur, but they only affect prices during non curtailment periods. So that idea of trying to use curtailment um, uh, to, to benefit resources or these PV resources for, for providing operating reserves doesn't really, uh, these, these scarcity pricings don't really impact those outcomes, although it, it is a, a secondary in, impact um, in, in other periods, uh, primarily um, hours where there's no curtailment. Um, I forgot to mention. So all hours are shown kind of in this dark purple. I guess it shows up as black for here. Um, the green or teal are hours where there's no curtailment and, and the yellow are hours with curtailment. And so that, that scarcity or shortage only impacts periods uh, primarily when there's uh, no curtailment, the green bars. And then we see uh, at larger PV levels, um, there's an interaction with both the zero marginal cost PV and we assume zero marginal cost storage that have a price suppression effect, which makes sense. Um, so you're really driving down prices for reserves, especially during the time of curtailment, the yellow bars. Um, storage is the primary driver of this. Um, this really kind of highlights the need to understand how storage interacts in these markets. Again, I know this is being talked about in a lot of market design circles. Um, the reason I highlighted this box, again, I, I know I'm running out of time, but uh, the point is, is that if you compare that against the, the case where no wind, solar, or storage can provide reserves, um, storage sees, basically has 
significantly reduced um, during those yellow boxes of uh, reserve prices, more so than in a case where storage can't provide reserves, but wind and solar can, which is the upper right. Um, so by the time you get to the base case where you allow all of those resources to provide reserves, you see, relatively speaking, um, little difference between the base and the no VRE reserves um, because storage has basically um, taken the lion's share of the price suppression at that point. So just to wrap up, um, I'm not going to talk through all of these, um, but hopefully I'll just leave this up here. It might prompt some discussion. Um, some thoughts related to flexibility. So wholesale market design is kind of this first section here. And really just, again, getting back to some points that we've already raised in other discussions of revisiting market structures to better reflect the true value of not only flexibility, but also reliability, externalities, lost opportunity cost. Um, you know, as we start thinking about other resources, including demand response, um, some of these facts like the opportunity cost plays into this. Um, future work um, is the next section. And I think there's a lot that we can do here to, to further explore flexibility sources, drivers, and trade-offs. Um, again, won't get into this right now, but if there's any thoughts that come up, happy to further expand. And then I have a slide for citations and then the obligatory thank you, but I'll go back to the, this one. Great, thank you.